Okay, hello everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to the National Botanic Gardens and the latest in our spring online lecture series. Um, having a whale of, the time, of a time at Dublin's Dead Zoo. Uh, it's going to be a ton of fun, tons of fun. Um, so the Dead Zoo, what is Dublin's Dead Zoo? Um, some may be, may be very familiar with this term, others may be very curious of what the Dead Zoo is. Well, the Dead Zoo is the natural history collection of the National Museum of Ireland. The National Museum of Ireland has several branches and of course they're all closed at the moment, closed to the public. So, uh, but of course, the work behind the scenes goes on, the work with the collections goes on, and there's been a lot of specific work to do with the building and the collections recently. So today we're joined by Paolo Viscardi and Karen Van Dorp. Um, and as we await the reopening of the museum, uh, we're just going to show you a bit of what goes on behind the scenes and some links with the Botanic Gardens there as well. Now, Paolo Viscardi started his museum career in the National Museum uh, of Ireland in 2005. And since then, he spent a decade working as a natural history curator in London before returning to the Dead Zoo working as a curator there. Uh, he's overseen the removal of one million objects from the museum in that time, the largest and most difficult being the fin whale, which you're going to hear about today. Karen then, Karen van Dorp, was part of the Dutch uh, whale strandings team for over a decade and uh, worked on dismantling and restoration of many numerous large whale skeletons uh, during her time as curator with the, the, Nash, the Dutch National Museum of Natural History. She now works as an ecologist in the west of Ireland and also enjoys working with and for whales and dolphins in the natural environment with the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group. Um, she has teamed up with Paolo on this uh, project uh, last December for the moving the fin whale, as you can imagine, it takes a lot of work. Um, and we're going to find out a lot more about that project now. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, hand over to Paolo. So I'll ask you to share your screen there, Paolo. That's the show. It's, it's, it's there. So I'm just going to bring that up there and I'll bow out. All right. Great. Thanks very much for that, Mark. Um, it's nice to nice to be here, as it were, in the Botanic Gardens, even if it is virtually. Um, so I'm going to just talk through uh, what we've been up to um, for the last kind of six months or so in the museum. Uh, and it's it's been quite a busy time. So uh, if you're not familiar with the Dead Zoo, and I know not everybody is based in Ireland and, and you may not have seen it before, um, but the Dead Zoo is what we call the Natural History Museum here. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a local colloquial name and we, we've embraced it because it's a great name uh, and it's an amazing place. So as you can see, this is a cut through of the building, a kind of virtual cut through. Um, and if you ever want to go and have a look around the building and you've never been here before, you can just follow that link there, museum.ie slash NH3D. And it means that you can actually have a virtual tour around the various floors we've got in the building, several of which aren't actually well, haven't been accessible to the public for over 10 years because we've had some problems in the building with the structure. And it's those structural problems which have kind of led us to um, the position where we need to remove the whales. So I'll go into a little bit of detail about that. This is a cut through the building. You can kind of see that it's very, very densely packed. There's a huge number of ob objects. We've got around 10,000 on display and then another uh, probably, I don't know, 50, 60,000 uh, in storage. Uh, and then uh, in that roof space, you can see there's kind of not very much up there apart from dirt and uh, nightmares, frankly. Uh, and one of the nightmares is, are holes. So back in 2018 in March, kind of not, not far off this time of year, uh, we had some really, really bad storms in Ireland. Um, some of you who, who were in Ireland haven't probably remembered the beast from the east. Uh, huge amounts of snow, very fine, and it kind of came with a, a strong, quite a strong wind behind it. So um, we ended up getting snow coming into the building and settling in the roof space and then melting. And so basically it rained in the building for a week or so. Um, and so we had to take uh, extreme steps to protect the specimens on display. We had to make tents, we had to build little uh, kind of raincoats for the elephant and all sorts of things. It was, it was a horrible experience. And the main reason for that is just because the roof um, is nearing the end of its life. The museum is around, well, it was, it was uh, built in 1856, opened to the public in 1857. And uh, we call ourselves a museum of a museum because it hasn't really changed very much since then. There have been some you know, developments in the way in which we display things and the number of objects on display, but the actual physical building hasn't really changed significantly in all of that time. And so this, um, this photo is showing you the space inside the roof in the museum. And there are, you can see layers and layers and layers of history um, with different things being kind of added and put up. But most of this, this kind of complex strut work and beams, all these timbers and so on, those are all there uh, to support uh, a couple of whales which are hanging from the ceiling. 
And those whales um, are, they're very, very um, kind of immediately recognizable. It's quite unusual to have whales in this configuration. Um, the one above is the fin whale, which Karen will be talking about in more detail. And the one below is a humpback whale, and that's a young individual. Um, and unlike most whales hung from ceilings, as um, the, the big one is, is fine, it's on metal bars hanging from that, from that roof space. But the one below it is actually hanging on chains through the fin whale specimen. So it makes it quite difficult to access. And of course, when you need to get a new roof, as it turns out we need to because of all those leaks and all the problems we've had with it, um, you have to get the whales down first. And so that was the challenge that we were posed with. Um, and in order to do that, we have to kind of understand how uh, the whales went in the first place. And so we know that they weren't there originally. Um, and actually the fin whale, which was added around 1892, um, it was originally down on the ground floor and the way in which it came into the building was along a long curved corridor that connected the museum to Leinster House, which is kind of just behind it. There are these big wings which kind of arch out. And so it's actually quite a nice big clear route through and it's quite easy to bring things into it. You can bring an elephant along the corridor that we used to have. But since then, that's all been cut off. Uh, there's a wall in the way now. So um, we know that things came in that way, but Obviously, that, that leaves us with the problem, how do we get them out again? Um, so they took the specimen from downstairs and they hung it from the ceiling, um, probably using just blocks and tackles and lots and lots of people. Uh, it's a huge amount of work. It's probably done in-house, actually. I think the museum uh, staff did the actual work to install that specimen. So it wasn't done by people who were familiar with mounting whales. It was done by people with a good idea about natural history and you know some experience of mounting other skeletons, but not necessarily something of that sort of size. And when you're talking about a whale skeleton, you're talking about tons of, of bone there. Um, and again, Karen will give you a lot more information about that. This is uh, the, the museum space kind of a few years later. And you, you may notice just down in this case down uh, at the bottom there, where the red arrow is pointing, there are a couple of big uh, whale flippers. And those are actually from the humpback whale. So while the fin whale has been uh, in the collections for quite a long time, it was uh, acquired back in the 1850s, um, we also acquired the a uh, humpback whale much more recently, or I say much more recently, still over 100 years ago. Um, and basically that was uh, sent up to us uh, in, in parts. We got the fins first, and the fins you know, are huge. That's me lying next to one of them there. Um, and I'm about average height, so 5'10", 5'11". Five, 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 um, but we got those flippers before we got the rest of the skeleton. And that's because the rest of the skeleton was actually uh, rotting down in the botanic gardens. So it's quite a nice link to have one of our specimens um, directly um, prepared in the uh, botanic gardens uh, kind of up the road, uh, which, which is nice to have. And that, uh, once it was fully cleaned, uh, we ended up mounting it directly below the fin whale skeleton. Uh, and I say we, it was actually done by the Moore Brothers, taxidermists of uh, Liverpool. And they, they did a nice job of it. Um, it's, it's quite nicely mounted, but it's quite difficult to kind of access because of the, the glass cases uh, underneath it. Um, and one of the big issues with the building is that restricted access. So you've got these mahogany cases and glass. It's all mahogany and plate glass. They're, they're very delicate, they're historic. They've been around for as long as the specimens have been around. Um, they're very difficult to take apart. So in order to be able to empty the space completely, um, it, it, we just didn't have time to do that in the time scale that we need to get the roof repaired in or replaced in. Um, and so we had to work out a way of accessing those specimens, which, uh, and, and also getting them out of the building. So as I said, the corridor is gone. So we had to try to work around the, uh, the openings that we could create. And the only opening we were able to make uh, was taking out one window and removing some of the brickwork around it, which is a fair bit of work in its own right. It gave us this space. And so everything that we take out of this building basically has to go out of that window, uh, including the whales. So you can imagine how much of a challenge that is. Uh, then we had to kind of work out routes through the space and making sure that we were able to access it using safe scaffolding and so on. Uh, all of these things are actually um, quite complex when you have a very, very packed museum space. So you have to move other objects out of the way so they're not going to get damaged. We had to build case protections over the specimens to give us uh, working platforms because 
if you if you look at the clearance between the uh, the kind of the largest case in that space and the humpback whale is literally um, that the flippers were touching the top of those cases, and as a result, it meant that um, we we just couldn't use scaffolding and things like because we didn't have any space to put it in. So what we had to do was to build really, really solid, stable platforms that could take an awful lot of weight. Um, that smaller whale probably weighs around a ton, um, or maybe a little over. Uh, so we had to be able to take that kind of weight, plus people standing there and working, plus any equipment that we needed. So just to access that first smaller whale um, required a huge amount of carpentry, and the OPW um, did the work on that carpentry, uh, the BMS Building Management Services, uh, did an incredible job. They were fantastic to work with, and they were really, really careful and respectful of the space. Um, and that's the trouble with working with museums and these, these kind of historic buildings. You, you just have to have a lot of respect the environment you're working in because things are fragile and things are really important you know, historically scientifically as well so you don't want to damage them and so one of the things that we uh, had to kind of work out is how to get access to take this thing down because you can't just cut the chains on a whale and, and catch them in a kind of sheet held underneath or something like that um, it wouldn't really work so uh, we had to use gantries and you can just see the uh, the uh, aluminium gantry that we use there and that has a, a lifting capacity of two tons and what we did was we had to build up uh, layers of the floor to spread the weight so that there wasn't too much weight going in single points on that floor because again the building was built in 1857 or opened in 1857 and um, it has a huge amount of weight already on the floor and it can't take much more so we have to be really careful about things like floor loading and um, once we got the platforms in place, we could actually get up to the specimen and have a good look at it. We, we were able to get in and do some cleaning. Um, so this is our uh, preventative conservator, Sylvia. Um, she's been fantastic through the project. Uh, so she got up there and, and gave everything a good clean um, so that people who were working on it didn't have to breathe in all the dust and uh, they could actually see what they were doing. And the people who worked in that particular specimen were Michael here on the, uh, on the right and uh, Yolene, who's on the left there. And so uh, they came over in October uh, of last year to start work on the, on the humpback whale. And um, they started by taking off all the extremities. So you, you can't start by um, kind of taking off the middle sections, obviously, because you've got all these other bits of bone which are still connected up to them. So you start with things like the fins and then you take off the ribs. And as you go along, you have to make sure that everything's properly labelled um, so that you don't lose track of what goes where. Um, and Obviously, these things are all going to be wrapped and packed and taken off site and stored for however many years it takes for the work on the building to take place. And then they're going to get reinstalled. And when you come back to do a jigsaw puzzle, you know, several years later, you really want to make sure everything's properly labeled to be able to put the pieces back together again a bit more easily because we're not doing it for fun. And, um, you know, with a jigsaw puzzle, if you labeled everything, it would be a bit boring um, for putting a whale back together. Boring is good. Um, because if it's not boring, it's exciting and exciting with a whale hanging from a ceiling is not something you want to experience. So the wrapping and packing, even that is quite difficult. So we had to do a lot of manual lifting. Not everything was able to go out the window simply because it's very difficult to get things from that height down to the ground without using large cranes uh, and they're really expensive. So anything that could be carried down the stairs by hand, we carried downstairs by hand. And we'd build a lot of these uh, what we call handling boards, which allow us to provide support for the parts of the specimen. So this is one of the fin, uh, one of the flippers, one of the fins um, from the whale. Um, and it's all been supported and stabilized using this white foam, this high density foam called uh, Plastazote. It's fantastic stuff, really useful. And it's been held in place by things like galvo band and it's been screwed down with the plasters to protect the specimen from the, the metal band. There's bits of timber which have been used to reinforce the heavier ends of the, um, of the shoulder from up in this area of the, of the whale's flipper. Um, and so all of those kind of skills have, have come together to create a, a nice stable package which we can use to, to take the specimen off site. Um, now, Getting it down, the hardest bit was actually getting past the chains which were hanging from the specimen above, because if you try moving those chains, it immediately transferred um, that movement to that huge fin whale specimen, which then started wobbling around above your head. It was really scary. So um, we did our best to stabilize the specimen from below. We, we built this kind of um, 
gantry out of timber, heavy timbers. There's, there's a double gantry of timber there. And we suspended the skull uh, and took the weight from kind of either side of the, uh, the chain that was hanging down suspending the specimen and lifted it up using those electric winches, which had been strapped to the, uh, to the wooden gantry. And that allowed us to cut the chain. And that was quite an exciting moment. So uh, this, is, this is us cutting the chain. We had to use gigantic bolt cutters to get through it. Um, and that was one of the kind of first big milestones of the project. And of course, with uh, social distancing and COVID, we, we weren't even allowed to high five. It was, it was a bit of a shame uh, when you're trying to work on a project like this and you have a really good relationship with people. And Michael's fantastic to work with. Um, and so is Karen, who we'll be talking in a minute. Um, so it, it's a real shame when you can't kind of, I don't know, bond with the people you're working with so closely. But it was really important just for the, for the safety side of things. So once we managed to get the specimen chain cut, we were able to bring the gantry in above it properly and connect everything off. And that made lowering the skull much more easy. So um, all we did for lowering the skull was to, um, to connect it up to a, uh, an electric winch and then use a couple of straps to guide it down carefully as we dropped it from the side um, of the box that it had been hanging over. And once it landed, uh, we were left with the problem of trying to hold the skull together because, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is quite a young animal and that meant all the bones hadn't fused. And actually, whales don't really fuse their bones much anyway. They're, they're, they're not taking force in the same way that something walking on land is. So they, it, it doesn't really matter if some of the bones aren't very well fused. Um, in this case, they, they're literally kind of a bit of a skull that was like this had come like this. And so you can see the, the, where the bone's unknitting. So we had to make sure that wasn't going to get any worse. Um, and obviously, if you've got to lift this on its side out of a window, you need to make sure it's really well supported. So and the team of, of uh, guys here includes some carpenters. Uh, this is the Morris Ward team who have been working with on packing and wrapping lots of specimens. But the whales are, are one of the um, specimens they worked on. And this is them putting together a lovely frame, which we used to, uh, to actually lift the specimen down from the uh, um, hole in the window. We turned it on its side, we pushed it out on little wheels, and then we lowered it down using a crane. Um, and then it went onto the back of a truck. So we were able to move it to our offsite storage facility, which is out in Solent. Uh, and the, the beauty of this is that the crate was so well made that there was no problem with the you know, quarter ton weight that was in it. Um, and none of the bones shifted even a millimetre. We measured them uh, with calipers before and after the move. And we found that it was absolutely um, solid. There were no problems at all, which is fantastic. That's always what you want to see. Um, we actually took a walrus out at the same time as the whale skull, and that had to go out on its side as well. But that was much easier because a stuffed walrus is basically like a sofa. So um, they're, they're much easier to manage than these, these quite delicate bones. Now, to get the fin whale down um, took an awful lot more preparation because um, because of the weights involved and the fact that we would need quite an extensive scaffolding platform uh, in order to access it, we had to actually back prop uh, from the floor, on, from the first floor, which is where all this was taking place, back down to the ground floor. Um, and so we, we had to install these uh, kind of acro pop, uh, props to spread the weight downwards. Um, and then they were able to start building this really, really quite uh, massive uh, scaffolding construction. And again, um, McCrory's who came into this work, they were fantastic. They did a really, really good job. And again, the guys who came in were really respectful. You know, they, they, they understood what they needed to do and they understood what the limitations of space were. But it did mean that, you know, you had guys carrying 50 kilo um, steels around up ladders and things like that, because that's the only way to get access in the building. It's, it's really difficult working in these tight spaces. Um, but, um, Literally, the moment they finished, they put the last of the boards down and it meant that we were able to get started on cleaning the specimen. And this is literally a couple of days before uh, Karen um, and, and Michael turned up to start taking the whale down. So um, I'm going to hand over to Karen now and let her tell you about that part of the experience. Uh, it was it was fantastic work with her. I'd actually met Karen not long before, earlier in the year. Um, and it was really nice to see her again and actually get a chance to work with her because uh, she, she's an absolute pleasure. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the talk. Thanks, Paolo. Uh, can you hear me well? Guys, can you hear me? We can indeed, Karen. Go ahead. Oh, brilliant. Thank, thanks so much, Mark and Paolo. Um, 
great, great part of that talk, Paolo. Um, I'm just going to continue and explain um, all the people uh, how we kind of progressed from there. Um, so I went over to the museum for the first three weeks of December of last year um, to get the fin whale down. And so in this part, I'll kind of walk you through it. Um, I try to keep it light um, but, uh, and it won't, hopefully it won't be too technical, but feel free to ask me or Paolo any questions at the end of the talk. So, but before I thought, you know, before we're just going to look at more bones, I thought it would be nicely to kind of quickly remind you of what a fin whale actually looks like when it's not a skeleton. So this is it, uh, second largest animal on the planet. Males in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, they kind of grow up to 20 meters um, and they weigh up to 50 tons. In the Southern Hemisphere, they, they can actually grow up to 27 meters and are a bit more, a bit heavier. Uh, they're very streamlined, it's a streamlined whale and they have a pointed head. Uh, they have kind of proportioned pectoral fins. You saw that lovely picture there with um, Paolo laying next to uh, the fins of the fin of a humpback whale or the flipper. Uh, these, uh, these are not as long, they're kind of proportionate, and especially when you compare them between the two. And they have so the, and they have a, they have a curved dorsal fin, which is also kind of uh, obvious. And then if you if you would ever be uh, kind of out whale watching and you would uh, see a big whale and you wasn't sure what species you were looking at. Fin whales have a very distinct whiter, uh, white lower jaw on the right side. So if you're on the right side of the whale um, and you see that lo uh, right lower jaw, uh, you can kind of distinguish it from, the, from, from younger blue whales or say whales, for example. So that's interesting. And I've also added uh, its Latin name. And it's great if you know uh, some Latin, because uh, usually the name, the Latin name describes whatever you're looking at very well, whichever plant or fungus or, or uh, animal you're looking at. Uh, and in this case, the name refers to the fact that um, that a fin whale is a baleen whale, and then th the second part of that word is ptera, which means wing. And it's, oh, it doesn't have wings, but it refers to the dorsal fin. And then Fasalis, it, it either it, there's a there's a few few examples or uh, a few explanations, but it's probably has something to do with its flow, which you know can be it's kind of columnar and it can be up to eight meters. And fin whales are actually, if you see in the next slide, you can see that they're fairly abundant again in Irish waters. Um, and these are uh, National Biodiversity, Biodiversity Data Center maps, and they show a land and a marine map uh, with a small little legend there in the top left corner. Um, you can see they're fairly abundant. Uh, and the Irish Royal and Dolphin Group uh, have identified more than 60 individuals to date. So th and they're mostly along the southern coast of Ireland. So if all goes well and, and we'll be able to get out on the water again at some point, uh, there's a good chance um, you might be seeing these magnificent creatures in Irish waters if you want to. Um, you can see their blow, uh, it's very columnar, and you can kind of see them all year round. But the most sightings historically have been in and around November. Um, but sometimes something goes wrong and one of these fin whales strand on the Irish coast as well. So that was the fate of this particular specimen that we're talking about today. So um, Paolo has talked about the reason the fin whale skeleton needed to come off that ceiling. And it was the long awaited refurbishment of the museum, especially the roof, which was leaking, which is, absolute, which is an absolute nightmare um, for museum specimens. So my former colleague Michael van Leeuwen, and I, we've worked together uh, on large whale skeletons many times before uh, during my time as a curator in the National Museum of Natural History in the Netherlands, um, on skeletons, but also on live whales. And the pictures that I'm showing you today won't involve very gory pictures, which is great for talks. Uh, and Michael invited me to help on this fin whale skeleton. Very, very convenient that I was already living in Ireland, so uh, it wasn't it wasn't too hard of a wasn't too much of a, a drive. To Dublin from I live in, in County Clare. So uh, this is the situation when we arrived and we had we just found this incredible scaffolding in place. We were so impressed by it. It's really good. Uh, site safety is important, especially in a place like this where you don't only have to protect yourself but also the object you're working on and all the hundreds of other objects in the glass cases that were so historically and beautiful. So impressive as we was, we kind of started and considering there's no elevators in this building and, and, and the doors are very narrow and the glass cases were not to be moved, it, you know, just, just let it kind of sink in that this scaffolding is just a very impressive job. So because of the nature of the job, there's a, a major focus on health and safety. There always is, but like, especially, you know, when you're working with, a, 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 an object of this size, you kind of have to be careful. So I've, I have all my Dutch certificates for working on construction sites, which is which it basically is 
Um, but in Ireland, these were not recognized. So the first thing we had to do was get a, a mobile, mobile scaffolding course, which kind of involved hours of watching PowerPoint presentations on mobile scaffolding, and then at the end, a practical exam. So you see that scaffolding tower on the left. Uh, I had to assemble, just move and disassemble that tower on my own, which was very funny to do, uh, and another skill I now possess. Uh, and this was on the first day at 10 o'clock at night, so we're kind of ready to go the next day. Um, but yeah, so uh, apart from mobile scaffolding, there's other health and safety that's also important in, if, in preparing a workplace like this. Uh, you kind of have to tie red and white ribbons to all the protruding parts up until the point where the platform looked extremely sort of Christmassy. Um, but yeah, you really don't want to walk into a pointy bit of a metal frame, even with a, with a helmet on. Uh, we've all done it, Paolo, Michael and I, but yeah, no, it's really better if you, if you don't. Um, uh, and so you have to have enough lights in places, so no blind, you're not being blinded by lights everywhere. You shouldn't be walking under a wheel of this size uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, especially That's especially important the further you kind of get in the process because it gets very unstable. Uh, and also you have to keep your, your entire workplace clean and tidy. I mean, it all kind of, it's all sort of common sense, but really if you think about it, you really don't want to trip or fall off this platform or, or get a, a whalebone on your head. So cleaning the workplace is kind of the, the most time consuming job you have here, but it's, it's by far the most important. Uh, and you kind of have to use your common sense. You have to move slow, you have to take breaks, uh, you, you know, it's man manual handling, like it's all very heavy. So and you're doing this for three weeks straight for maybe ten, eight to 10 hours a day. So you kind of have to keep a straight head and you also have to have a plan. So um, we kind of planned for everything you can think of. So we had a COVID plan, we had a health and safety plan, a technical plan, and then we were, you know, we had planning as we went, etc. And then there's still many things you can't plan for, like uh, in which direction the, sh the shoulder blade is going to swing, or you know, even if it's completely strapped, or which type of material was used to assemble the wheel almost 200 years ago. You kind of have to play it by ear. So the first thing, first thing after planning, you can. Go to the next slide. Um, is labeling. So, like Paolo said, each and every bow needs to be labeled correctly. It's really, but the best thing is if it's boring. So, you know, there, there's 177 bones in total in this uh, skeleton, and we all labeled them. Um, it's actually less than 206 adult, uh, adult humans have, so we were lucky there. You can see here in the picture that uh, we use Paraloid B72 or Acroloid, and it's used a lot in natural history uh, object conservation. Has many uses, uh, but we use it here diluted to 50%, and then it's an absolute great adhesive. Uh, it's great to use for natural history objects as it doesn't stain and it's non -yellow yellowing. Uh, but the most important um, uh, feature of it is that uh, it's actually really easily reversed. So, you know, in a, in a couple of years' time, if Paolo is ready and, and his team are ready to kind of well, hang it back on the ceiling, hopefully, then they could just get the labels off with some ethanol, and that's very easy. So here you go, it's a little part of the flipper. And then, yeah, so essentially what you kind of do during uh, during a job like this is you, you try to disassemble the wheel in the reverse way from how it was assembled. Uh, but no, nobody ever writes anything down, or at least you know we do now, but um, nobody did for the last 200 years. So you kind of have to carefully consider every step you're doing, but then in the reverse order, which is not easy to do. Uh, so normally when you do a job like this, you take the ribs off first, because that, that you do that kind of for stability, but as the gantry cranes that Paolo was mentioning before, we ordered them and they hadn't been delivered yet. So we started on the vertebrae, kind of taking them, you know, from the back to the front for sliding them off. Uh, and so we, so Mike and I drilled a small hole in the last caudal vertebra. So that's the first thing we did, and then it turned out that it was made of solid plaster, which is kind of a surprise for everyone. And uh, nobody knew this because it was kind of impossible to see from the balconies and nobody had been up close up till then. Uh, so the casts were done so well and the varnish over it was done so well that you wouldn't have guessed. So it was kind of a surprise. So that was surprise number one and many would follow. Um, and then also kind of after an hour of carefully wedging and pulling, it turned out there was a screw bolt inside on the end. So, you know, it go, just goes to show that you never, it's never really a straightforward process. Uh, and even if you worked on numerous large wheel scans, they're always different. You always find surprises. So in the end, it turned out that all caudal vertebrae and then some of the uh, lumbar vertebrae, they were modeled. And then in the picture, you can see very well how horse hair was also uh, used to make it more firm in the middle picture. 
Uh, and then all the vertebrae were weighed, so you could get an estimate of the entire weight of the skeleton. So yeah, that's us sawing along. And then so this this kind of went on and on. We can go to the next slide. And then you can see that Michael and I were kind of taking turns uh, sawing through and kind of pulling. I was pulling to give counterweight, which is which is fairly it's very tiring. Um, so th and then you know we found these joints obviously um, that uh, on the parts that that were sticking out into the ceiling uh, on the frame. Um, but not only on those frame parts going into the ceiling, but also kind of halfway, because you can imagine that this this is a skeleton that was about 19 meters long, so you have to have extra extra joints. Um, and all these bolts needed to be sanded down and then oiled. So for the for that, we used WD-40, and at some point we decided that the WD must stand for wheel disassembly. We thought this was hilarious. Um, and to our uh, to our own surprise, we found wooden plates between the intervertebral discs and the mixed and mixtures of horsehair and concrete and plaster. And sometimes, you know, this would be a, this material would be kind of up to three kilos every each time between the vertebrae. So we were hacking away, uh, and we had both never seen anything like this before in assembled wheeled skeletons. And we, we thought it was a bit unnecessary, but you know, as it makes the whole object really heavy, but yeah, I, what you can say is that, that it was done and it was done really, really well. Um, and th this kind of went on until we got to the real bones. So then they started only halfway the lumbar vertebrae. That's, so that's about 28 plaster vertebrae uh, before, before we saw real vertebrae, which is great because sawing through plaster means you have to wear safety glasses and a mask and you're covered in plaster dust, so it's not very healthy. Uh, so, but actually, uh, the real vertebrae made the job more difficult because the original bones were filled with a plaster concrete mixture with wooden wedges in it, uh, which we had to drill to pieces and then hack that away with a chisel uh, to, to get them loose. And this this took a long time. So we we spent all week on vertebrae. Um, we can go to the next slide, um, and and then we kind of weighed and packed them. And then we're getting a bit nervous here about the time frame. So, but luckily the gantry cranes arrived that Tuesday of the second week, and then uh, they were set up and we could start working on removing the rib cage, uh, which you can see here. But before actually uh, you remove the ribs, uh, you need to remove the flippers and the shoulder blades, and they're very heavy. And Paula did a great job helping us actually here, I remember very well, um, because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not as tall as Paolo, so it's very handy if you have long arms uh, and you can stick them up in the air so you can hold them very well. Um, so these are complicated objects and kind of where the fun begins, because you can see that it needs a lot of strapping. So this is a left shoulder blade, it's, con it's completely strapped in together with the flipper. Uh, and then you can lift the entire object kind of with a gantry crane and then you get the pressure off and then you can remove really old bolts uh, and then you can lower it slowly down. So it, just to do this takes a day. So this is me. Uh, I'm tying a long rope around the ribs, uh, and this might seem a bit insignificant, but it's actually a great safety measure. So when you when you take ribs off, uh, they come off of the, from the top, where they are attached to the vertebrae in the spine. Uh, and by tying them in with two of these ropes, uh, they don't swing everywhere when they come loose, because you don't really know where the where the weight is going to be. So that's actually a really good thing to do, which we learned over time. So here you go. Um, this is uh, Michael and I under, uh, well, not under the skull, kind of away from it. But um, so here, here you can see that the flippers are off, the shoulder blades are off, the ribs are off, and this is the point where a wheel starts looking like a giant tadpole, which is quite cute. And then obviously we need to get all the parts off the platform um, for which we used the largest gantry crane. And this is Michael doing very well, but then about 10 minutes later, he didn't pay attention to the electrical cable above his head and that got stuck in the pulley there and it snapped. So it just goes to show that you always do a job uh, better with two people in this case. Uh, but luckily Michael's a very smart man and he brought a spare one, so it didn't cause too much delay. So it became a bit of a circus sometimes, as you can see. But yeah, we got all the vertebrae off safely uh, and then all the way up to the neck uh, or the cervical vertebrae, which I think are beautiful. You can see them on the right here. And the first seven of these are the neck vertebrae. Um, and they, they're just they're just like we have, actually. We have seven as well, but they're a bit bigger. 
uh, and then the ribs are attached to the thoracic vertebrae they are above there. So here we are coming to a point where we were we were start we started thinking about the skull and how to get it down. Uh, so we're kind of dreading the moment here because the, the skull is a very complicated object. Like you saw the one you saw the one with the humpback wheel that, that Paolo showed, uh, and this is just, I'd say it's kind of like twice as big, maybe even bigger. So it's kind of half half a ton. Um, it's a complicated object. So the mandibles they're down there, the lower jaw they're very heavy, and the upper part of the skull is only is only kind of of this part only the back was original kind of the rest was kind of modeled with solid oak beams and, and kilos of plaster with hand forged nails in it and then uh, in the in the middle was a little part and that sticks out that that was original as well so complicated object and lots of lots of ways it could kind of come apart so yeah we're kind of dreading it but yeah um and then um it's also kind of difficult to reach the bolts as they were inside of the bone and the and, and plastered over so yeah you can see here kind of when the skeleton was hoisted up to the ceiling the bolts in the lower jaws they were attached after uh, but the other way around is complicated so you, you have to you have to first lift the mandibles a bit to get the bolts out and then lower the mandibles so it took a long time to kind of come up with a plan that we felt confident that would work and paulo must have thought what are these guys doing but we're actually thinking um so the, the bolts they, they have very uh, heavy tar paint uh, that needed to be removed with a chisel and then you could put WD-40 in for, for some days. And then the bars across, obviously, you know, the bar across, it wasn't going anywhere. So we couldn't really lift the skull and it, that made it, it was almost impossible, only just a few centimeters. Uh, and also in this picture, you can see very clearly that the rainwater, the rainwater has been leaking on the whale skull from the roof. Okay, so um, we strapped and we secured the skull part, uh, so we were able to lift the whole skull a few centimeters. And this took an entire day as well, and a lot of concentration, as you have to make sure that it stays leveled uh, and that the pressure is equally distributed to minimize the risk of cracking the skull or parts falling off, obviously. Uh, and then, yeah, we can go to the next one. And then sure enough, uh, I couldn't really take any pictures from from the most exciting moments here, but this is kind of when the when the mandibles are are off. Uh, so these are the first things we took off the skull, and um, it's actually doing the work then. So that's why there aren't too many pictures of it. But we managed to get the mandibles down uh, and off the platform late at night, which was great. And you can see in this picture that uh, Paddy is filming, uh, and he was with us for for some time, and he was making a documentary about it. So yeah. Um, yeah, you can see you can see John here with all the ribs. They went out as well. And then in the next slide, you can see that he's doing a great job on packing all the skeleton parts. So, Paulo explained how incredibly important it is to pack it right, and and so it doesn't move anywhere. Um, so yeah, and John is doing that here, and he's going to make space for for the largest uh, part of the skeleton, which is the skull. Now again, not too many pictures of lowering the skulls. We're actually, I'm actually doing the work. Um, but yeah, you can see it here going down. And this was an immense joint effort, which I really enjoyed because it's, it's, got, it's terrifying, but it's also just the sort of like the culmination of all the work you've been doing for three weeks. So this is the last day, and we're all, you know, we're happy, but we're super concentrated. There's a, there's a lot of staff members that came to observe this too. We didn't want to go, you know, we didn't want anything to go wrong. But yeah, we're doing it here. So yeah, we're all doing it together. And then in the next slides, you can see it worked perfectly and it reached the floor without a scratch on it just five minutes before 5 p.m. on the last day of those three weeks. And I was I was over the moon. And Paolo and his team made this incredible crate around it. And I think this is the one that moves, right? Yeah, so I was gonna start that video. So you can see that the skull uh, is, is a bit slanted. It can't stand up vertically in the crate and it had to be really narrow because obviously, you know, as, as Paolo showed you before, there's just one window where all the where all the material had to go through. And this is always the case for some reason. You get, you know, you have a lot of space to work in, but then in the end, there's just this tiny hole that, or a tiny space that, that uh, the objects have to go through. It seems to always be that way. So yeah, look at that crate, that's just, that's magic. It's really beautiful. And I think there was only about a centimeter left uh, 
between the crate and the and the top part of the of the window where it's going out and you can also see i mean many people must be familiar with this museum but you can see how different it looks now with all the glass crates are are, are protected from whatever work is going on so yeah hardly any space to make the to make the turn Here it goes, one more turn. And yeah, you can see this skull weighs half a ton and you can obviously imagine that you can't, that you can't lift this, you know, I mean, you can, but like, you're not gonna move it in a safe way. And this crate was so well made, you just needed two people and then you could roll it all the way to the back of the, of the room. And there it is, ready to be taken out of the window. Yeah, so here and out of the window it went. Uh, I don't envy Paolo for overseeing this process as it can be a bit stressful if you're dealing with really old natural history objects. This is all heritage, so you have to be really careful. Um, but yeah, everything went just fine. They're an incredible team, so there it goes and it went off to the to the storage in sorts. Right, so now these are, we're on to the last two slides and I just wanted to kind of briefly show you um, that taking apart a whale skeleton is not just about unbolting and wrapping individual bones and lowering them down, which you know, is, a, is exciting as it is, but the other really exciting part is that you always come across surprises that you don't really understand. So to finish off, there we can we can just discuss some mysteries here that we found. So so remember I talked about those modeled vertebrae. So they're a bit of a mystery as they were so well done, but then we realized that rubber molds did not exist during the time that the whale was hung on the ceiling. Um, and then also the, the so you know they they would have used something else, but they were so well done that you couldn't really see that they were not real and then also the drill holes in the wooden plate sometimes seemed like they were electrically drilled and we found modern electrical wire which is coated in plastic which would indicate that some work must have been done at a later stage after kind of 1960 uh, when these plugs started to be manufactured which would have been extremely difficult while the way it was hanging from the ceiling with the humpback wheel under it uh, but yeah we just don't know how it was done and you can you can be sure that in the 19th century there was much more knowledge about hoisting things up by hand. And these days we sometimes don't have that knowledge anymore because you know everything's done mechanically and we think it couldn't have been done by hand, but yeah, that's how fast it can go. You kind of lose knowledge. And apart from that, the, the very old techniques like horsehair or, or ostrich feathers in plaster, they were used over these plugs, which is also very interesting. I mean, you would you kind of, you know, you wonder why would why would that be? So we're kind of trying to create a timeline, but it just needs more digging into kind of various archives. And if you then look in the, on the next slide, you can kind of see some examples of objects that we found in and between vertebrae. So you can see a bumblebee, uh, you know, does that bumblebee tell us that the vertebrae were left outside during summer months or maybe in the national, you know, maybe in the, in the botanical gardens and it crawled in before the plaster went on? Uh, or did they use feathers from an old ostrich from the collection, from the collection to stuff the vertebrae? You can see that little feather there. So, and then also, yeah, we found this, we found this piece of a paper box and you can see the name of the company on it. Um, kind of, you know, thankfully we have Google these days and we turned out, turned out uh, that the Tyzak company was from Wales and it forged metal objects like bolts and frames. And by comparing the logo to different logos from the company over time, we were able to establish the time frame for when the frame must have been made. So, and then there's a fly as well. Uh, on which you could do, you know, if you really wanted, you could do population genetics to determine where it crawled in, in Ireland, if you wanted to, you know, if you really want to take it to the next level. So kind of, if you know, if you look at these things, you kind of really realize how important it is to write down entire processes when you work on natural history heritage objects from beginning to end. It's very valuable. Um, and, and that's shown time and time again uh, when you work on objects like this and you don't have anything written down. 
So yeah, that was more or less what I wanted to share with you. Um, Paulo, if there's anything you like to add to this, yeah, I think that's that's everything. I, mean, I don't know um, if I'm going to have a chance for questions. Yeah. Yes, indeed. I'll just uh, bring us back on screen there a second. I love the ending there, Finn. <laughs> okay. The second out. Right, Gio. Where's Paolo? You're still there somewhere? Yep, I'm still here. Uh, yeah, I think. It's, uh, there we go. Yeah. You're back there again. I am. Yep. Um, so, yes, we've time for a couple of questions. I'll start off myself, I suppose. First of all, I don't know how much context I put on that before at the start, but uh, it was an absolutely fascinating tour of through the incredibly intricate work and the very intensive work. And I can imagine quite a stressful amount of work having to uh, manipulate and, and manhandle all these um, artifacts. And because not, not only are you talking about the heritage objects that are the animals themselves in the collection and to treat those with respect, uh, um, but also the museum itself, it's a museum of a museum the whole construction of the building, it, it's an artifact in itself. I suppose a number, number of our questions are related to, you know, how going forward, uh, I suppose, first of all, is there a time frame on, on when this job will be finished? I, I can see it's almost uh, an, a never ending job, really. Yeah, at the moment, um, the whales are done. Um, they're out of the building. Uh, I think there's one vertebrae I found uh, in a crate yesterday. But other than that, they're completely out of the building and they're, they're tucked away safely uh, in our storage facility. So, you know, those two objects um, have been dealt with. We've still got, uh, we've been working solidly away with the team, um, decanting everything that we need to move for the roof. We've probably moved, uh, it must be close to 10,000 objects now. Um, and we've got another, probably another 10,000 or so to go. Um, but certainly, we're. I'm, I'm currently aiming, if, if you know, if everything goes to plan, to be done by the end of April. Um, okay. With all of that, obviously, we've been held up with things like um, you know, kind of restrictions and um, COVID and all that. Of course. The rest. So on, on the um, one hand, on the one hand, I suppose the restrictions mean that the building is is not visited by the public. But on the other hand, it means you can't work together as efficiently as, as exactly. you would. So it's not. It doesn't necessarily mean you've had a, a free hand to work the last while. Um, the couple of the, getting to some of the audience questions then, um, and now you can weigh in yourselves, whichever uh, whoever wants to answer. But in terms of the will, will the will the whales be displayed from the ceiling again, uh, or, or will it will it be part of the display, and will they be from the ceiling? Uh, um, will the, the roof be able to do that. I think uh, the plan. Well, at the moment, it's it's kind of a bit too early to be one hundred percent sure. Yeah. Um, but certainly, I, we we hope to be able to put them back not quite as they were because uh as i say one of them was hanging on chains through uh, the other one and that's not a very good way of doing no. it you never never choose to do it that way today it just it's just not safe um because if one fails they both fail it's a really bad way of doing it um so i i'd quite like to, actually i'd like to uh, hang more things from the ceiling if possible because we do okay. have plenty of other specimens which could be displayed in that way things like um seal skeletons and, and other whale skeletons smaller whales dolphins and so on so it might be an opportunity for filling that space with more similar sorts of objects um to get a better idea of the diversity of marine life around around the coast of ireland and the large mammals excellent because you'd have them to scale then as well Sorry, yeah. and then to, to add on that i think we kind of we you know we realized by taking the part that you could if you do it in a different way you you can actually take sort of half of the of the um, uh, the weight out yeah because yeah. you know there was so much cement and plaster in it that's really not necessary so even if you make it you know you could even use the old frame which we obviously kept as well um but then still be able to do it in a much lighter way mm -hmm. And in terms of some of those materials and the technology, when they are reassembled, um, obviously the, these adhesives and plasters and so on, they're artifacts in their own way. But I presume you won't be using them to hang up the skeleton again. You'd be using newer methods. Yeah, there's a lot of weight, <laughs> a lot of weight in what was used before. And it, it was, it was, you know, it, it did the job. You know, it's lasted sure. for 140 years or so. 
Um, so that's, you know, you can't complain about that, but at the same sure. time, it's, uh, it adds an awful lot of weight, as Karen was saying, and, you know, these days, um, we can do things with steel, which will allow us to have slightly more accurate uh, mounting, for example, um, and, you know, we've got things like 3D printing, so we can replicate some of the bits which were missing, so things like the, uh, the pelvis and so on, that, that they weren't there because they were just never recovered, and, yeah. you know, the corpus in a way was tiny, but it's still actually quite an interesting thing in its own right because it tells exactly. us about the evolutionary history and its relationship to land animals um, which is lost when you don't have that that kind of part of the animal there so those are the sorts of things that we could actually replace and you know there's there's a good reason to do that because so much of that specimen was actually artificial anyway um, yeah. so the flippers were were made of timber and plaster um, and it was only really the shoulder blades that were actually made of bone so you know, it's definitely been remodeled a lot in the past. And so there's no reason why we wouldn't do that, but maybe do it a bit better using modern technology um, and maybe in increase the amount of uh, remodeling that we, we kind of use uh, to help to tell other stories, really. Yeah. The thing the thing with um, with these objects is always that you, um, that in the old days, like people that work in museums now, they kind of look at it differently. In the old days, people used to think this is forever. Forever, it turns out, it doesn't exist, like not yeah. in museums or anywhere else. Um, so the reason why we're doing things differently now, uh, as, to, as opposed to hanging, you know, this wheel over the ceiling, we don't think about it as forever. We know that this building will eventually change or this wheel is going to come off. Like So those techniques are actually very handy. And then realizing in the back of your mind, it's not going to be forever. It's just going to make it more like an, you know, like an idea object, maybe. You know, you just you know that you're eventually going to take it off again, off the ceiling. For whatever reason, yeah. Yeah. And was it was it so again? You you can relate it then to the relationship of other mammals. It's very important. Would it would it have been anatomically correct the way it was laid out, um, relatively? Yeah, from, I'm, I'd I'd say it was. Uh, it was just a bit unnatural. I mean, you could you yeah. could see in the pictures that it was extremely straight, which was you know compared to the humpback whale. I think the humpback whale, just, I mean, it yeah. might be was a bit better, but you know those. I mean, taking it off and then doing it again actually gives you gives you an opportunity to make it a bit more natural. And was it was it a disappointment to discover so many plaster casts, or was it part of the? the I don't think so. I I mean I mean it's all it's all part of the story. Exactly. And. You know, we can speculate why um, it was in that condition because clearly, um, so the, the front of the face had fallen off or had become detached or wasn't used. The end of the tail um, and the vertebral column had come off and you know, or, or was really badly rotten or something had happened to those bones and the flippers. Normally, um, that's the kind of thing that happens when uh, things are decomposing at sea, so bits drop off and you, know, you yeah. can't recover them, or um, maybe they're just so so manky from you know, decomposition products from the from the flesh and the the blubber and everything that's rotting away that the bone itself gets kind of burnt by the uh, by the uh, oils and stuff. Yeah, stuff going out of that it can get quite nasty. Um, it can get quite unpleasant if it oxidizes. So uh, you know, there, there can be all sorts of reasons why it's like that. But the fact that it was so well done opens up kind of um, additional stories to, to investigate because you know who made those those plaster casts or those vertebrae they're, they're perfect um you know they're, they're absolutely fantastic it's, it's almost yeah. impossible to tell just by looking at them that they were made of plaster until we started to actually chip away at them so clearly they've been made with you know by someone who really knew what they were doing yeah um, and yeah, working plaster like that is not a skill that you just pick up. That's something which takes a huge amount of experience. So, you know, there, there would have been someone who knew what they were doing to make those in the first place. So, you know, it'd be interesting to research that and, and figure yeah. out how, how, how did they even learn? I mean, it's and it's um, it's unfortunate then as you said it wasn't documented because, of course, you've documented every step of your process, so it's it's retrievable in the future. Whereas it's just unfortunate that we don't know who would have um, had the craftsmanship to to make these. Um, artificial parts of the bones would there have been would you know of the percentages of each skeleton how real how much real material there would be mm. uh, i would say What's, for the fin wheel yeah, probably... 60 to 70 well maybe <laughs> not because the skull wasn't i mean the upper part of the skull wasn't 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 original yeah. for a large part so it depends on how you judge it. Is it by voice yeah, or is exactly. it by, uh, by, by number, numbers of bones or, or, or exactly? Yeah, yeah. 
And somebody asking, does no, of course, the maybe bits of the whale are still up in the old botanic gardens. Um, somebody's asking, do do the whales belong to the collection of the National Museum? Yeah. Um, that's yeah. that's presumably where they belong to. Yeah, yeah. Actually, and I realised that we didn't really go into the history of what we do know about this whale, about the fin whale. Uh, we do know that it's from Bantry Bay. That's where it was uh, auctioned off, and we okay. know that uh, somebody uh, was sent down um, with about six pounds, I think, uh, at the time, uh, to get it. Uh, to Dublin, um, and we don't know exactly how much of that skeleton was there, That's and we don't crazy. know how much the person that went down with the six pounds uh, and then paid another three pounds, I think, for the for the transport, knew about whales. So you know, he, he might have thought, well, this is more or less okay. Um, so it might might be the case that there's still some of those bones in in Bantry Bay. It might be the case that they there's still some bones under the ground in the botanical gardens. Who knows where they are? Uh, they might be in the collection. So yeah, there's there's still know. so much to learn. And in terms of, sorry, go on, Paolo. I was just going to say, actually, Nigel uh, Monaghan, the uh, our keeper, um, he he actually wrote up uh, a history of the whale, both whales actually, um, and that was then the it was published in the last uh, Irish Naturalist Journal. So, uh, so that information is actually out and about now, um, which is which is really useful. Uh, so That's great. Cool yeah, Charlotte's just put that in the chat box there. That's great. Oh, that, um, because Nigel will be giving a talk this next week, actually. Yeah. Um, how possible or desirable would it be to get a new skeleton, say? I mean, how, I don't know how often fin whale skeletons wash up on the Irish coast or humpback whale skeletons. I know it does happen from time to time, but how easy is it to get? And of course, then, well, these these are in their own right, they're part of the history of the museum. But would, would there be, would you prefer to have a new skeleton? Um, well, from my perspective, a new skeleton would be, in some ways, in some ways, it would be better because it would be more complete. Uh, we would have more control about how we mounted it and all the rest of it. And it's a lot easier to work with kind of freshly prepared modern material, um, which you understand fully, than it is to work with historic material, which has a lot of kind of modelling and all the rest of it going on. But at the same time, um, dealing with a fresh whale is a huge amount of work. So uh, that's something which Karen deals with all the time. So I'll let her take over there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think preparing a fresh skeleton for display is a lot of work, and it can be it can be done. Like we, you know, many people over, all over the world do it all the time. I do have to say that my personal preference would actually not go through all that work and just stick with the historical specimen because you have to realize it's part of the museum and it's part of of the story of the museum and you have to realize that all of your grannies and granddads probably saw it and 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 to kind of build on that it's just i mean it's heritage so it's not just a, a, the story about showing a specimen it's show, showing that particular specimen that has been there for almost 200 years so yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't sometimes it's true and you would and it would be good to kind of go for for the most real object maybe you know that's that's in some in some institution that that's what kind of the major goal but i don't think it should be because especially again given i suppose that it's a museum of a museum is, is what it's always described as the yeah. two things you always see are the dead zoo and a museum of a museum uh so it's it it, it, it fits i suppose with that story did the adhesives and plasters and so on used in the original assembly did they do any damage to the skeleton that's there um would these have been corrosive materials or like that. Sorry, Mark, I didn't, I didn't get the question. Well, would the original adhesives and plasters and cement and so on, would they have damaged the skeleton? I mean, obviously there was, there were hammering and bolts and stuff. But... No, it was harder to, it was harder to, to get it off without mm -hmm. any damage. Uh, obviously, it was very hard to get the plaster, uh, yeah. the plaster vertebrae off without damaging it. We actually had to saw through the middle, which was, which is terrible for a person yeah. that wants to preserve everything. Uh, so yeah, we were that, that hurt a bit. Uh, but yeah, I think. For the rest, it was okay. I think. Would you agree, Paolo? I think some of the yeah. some of the bolts would do some damage to sort of larger larger parts. Think, but um, the the way in which the okay. kind of internal armature had been set up with you know the various kind of blocks connecting them together, there there were some places where it was done in such a way that it wasn't actually um, kind of very sensitive to the specimen. So they'd hacked out bits of bone to be able to squeeze in these kind of. Uh, um, joins between bits of bar, um, and, you know, they'd, they'd had to kind of, uh, where, where the down, um, the supports from the ceiling coming down onto that bar had gone, they'd also kind of drilled into the bone and things like that. And with all the plaster, which is very difficult to get off without damaging the bone, um, those are the sorts of things which, you know, that's the kind of stuff we try not to do these days. 
um, you try to, to have a lighter touch when you're um, kind of adhering things. So you use reversible adhesives that are much, much easier to undo if you need to undo them. You try to avoid having um, kind of things going through the bone if you yeah. can avoid it. Um, you, you're, be, you're better off building a kind of a, a lighter weight, maybe you know, steel um, yeah, structure okay. or yeah. find them underneath. So it's just we've changed the way in which we mount things uh, because we, we don't like just hacking chunks out anymore. We try to keep it in one piece as much as we can. And I've seen you know lots of different techniques. You know these days I've seen people in, inserting strong magnets into bits of uh, into the tops of bones so that you can. You know, you can stick the, the legs on and then take them off if you want to use them for teaching or for some outreach or something like that. Excellent. So, you know, there, there are different ways you can do it. And I think, you know, the technology is there that we can do these things in a much more um, sympathetic way. So, you know, yes. that, that's one of the reasons I, I do like new things in the sure, you, sure. you can select what you actually want them to do and you can use them like that. But I, I do, you know, I, I agree with Karen. It's, uh, it's kind of nice having the historic feel from the place. And what the thing is, I would much rather we didn't suspend the humpback whale from the ceiling in the same way, um, because I, it's it's kind of scary because it's kind of falling apart so much. Um, you now, I guess with a modern method of, of supporting it from underneath, it would probably be okay. We could probably do it. Um, but you know, if you go back far enough in time, it was just its flippers on display, um, and the original labels are still on there from when they've been glued on to talk about which of the bones in the flippers. Um, correspond to which bones in your hand, for example. Yeah. So when it was on display, it had it had a different purpose. So you know, there, there's there's some really interesting history just in those specimens, which you know, I, there's there's so much to find out just by kind of looking at it. It's it's fantastic. And we've only a couple of minutes now left. I know you're you're both very busy, and I'll, I'll let you go shortly. But uh, uh, will they, there will be some cleaning done to the the bones themselves before they're put on display again, or would they be? Well, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they need a lot of cleaning. They're, they're pretty filthy. Okay. And is there much water damage to the collection in general in the Natural History Museum, or did you get to most things? In no, we, we got to most things in time. Um, there, there, are, there are a few specimens which uh, have have you know, had some damage. Which I mean, it's, it's repairable damage, um, which okay. is you know the best kind of damage. But still, we'd rather not have any damage at all. Obviously, um, it's not ideal. And certainly, um, the staining on the whales is relatively straightforward to clean compared to you know some things. And um, we we. Certainly, the elephant um, seems to be a little bit unhappy from where the water had got onto it. So, you know, that, that's why we built him a, a little tent and raincoat um, yeah. to, to keep him dry. But, you know, there, there will be some kind of work required to, to uh, pull his skin back together again on top where it's had a chance to swell up because of the water. So, the, you know, there, there are bits like that, but actually, they are, you know, repairable. And to be honest, the collection is so old, there's quite a lot of work that was required anyway. Just sure. You know, from being on display for 120 years, um, it takes its toll. So there's always always work to be done on collections. It, it uh, takes its toll on the entire method of and methodology of display. And what so other what other projects are happening in that? Is there going to be a different way of displaying the collection in general, or is it going to be a cabinet museum all the same? No, we, we don't want to change the look and feel of the space. Um, I think you know I, everyone loves the dead zoo as it is. Um, I think people have long memories of coming with their parents or their grandparents, and that goes back generations. We don't really want to change the feel of the space, but what we do want to do is make sure that it's actually um, kind of safe and fit for 21st century, uh, century audience. So the number of people coming through the doors uh, today are significantly higher than they were you know, 50 years ago. So we, we can't really kind of manage in the same way that we did 50 years ago. Um, so if we if we open the doors and just let everyone onto the balconies, for example, they have been closed for like ten years or so. Yeah. Um, part of the reason why is because we're so popular now that if you've got all of the people in the building who um, you know would have come around normally, um, you could take the loading on the balcony from like fifty years ago or twenty years ago. Now, with the number of people in the building, the balcony is physically not strong enough to take the weight of all those people. You know, it could collapse. We do not want that to happen. Yeah which is why we've not had it open for so long. Um, what we'd like to be able to do is to reinforce it and make sure that it is suitable to take a modern audience. So, you know, so if we have a million people coming in a year, um, we're able to take the capacity of those people coming through without the building falling apart. 
So that's that's our you know our vision uh, is to is to make it safe and to have things like lift access because at the moment it's all of course little narrow staircases and so on and it's just not accessible. So we'd like it to be a space which people can actually get into and they can safely enjoy without actually changing the feel of it at all. If we can do that, we will be delighted. Excellent. Just like the ourselves at the Botanic Gardens, we want people to see these collections. We want people to engage with the collections and be fascinated by them. I can see in the comments here loads of people are sharing their memories of. Uh, as a child, looking at the skeletons for hours and so on. People I read, have, yeah. I've been really interested in how this is all put together. So thank you very much for your time, Paolo and Karen, today. Um, we have another talk actually next week from the National uh, from the Natural History Museum. Uh, Nigel Monaghan, the keeper of the museum, is going to give a talk, moving from the ceiling and the whales down to other aspects of the collection and how it connects in with artists and art. Um, thanks very much, guys, for your time today. Uh, thanks we really for having enjoyed us. that. And uh, folks, tune in to the rest of our talks. So all the best. Cool, thanks very much. Bye, Bye. thanks. Bye. Botanic Gardens out.